Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim, and I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to another irresistible round of the uh, College of Complexes, and I'm glad that everybody showed up tonight. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we'll have a brief announcements period. Then um, I will need, uh, and then we'll have our speaker who will speak for up to about an hour or so. He says it's gonna be about 35, 40 minutes. Then we'll have our question and answer period for him. Then we shall proceed to our infamous rebuttal period where we'll each get to speak on or off topic for a certain specified amount of time. We generally shut down about nine o'clock, but I'll keep the Zoom call open in case anybody wants to chat after we're our formal recording's done. All right, with that, Charlie, let's get the announcements started, okay? Okay, uh, welcome everyone to meeting number 3,660 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Okay, first of all, as always, I want to remind everyone that we have a Google email group. If you go to our main website, which you are recommended that you join in order to get upcoming announcements on uh, what's going to be the topic and speakers at the college. Not much traffic on there. Similarly to that, there is a meetup group with only one or two messages per week on, on the upcoming speaker and topics. Now, although I am not a capitalist, I will briefly give an, an advertisement for our upcoming programs. On April the 9th, we're going to begin our Earth Day series of speakers. And it, April the 9th, the Chicago-based group, the One Earth Collective, will be telling us about their various activities. On April the 16th, we're going to discuss and learn about the possible use of hydrogen uh, to, to arrive at a net zero net zero carbon economy. Everybody wants that. On April the 23rd, an organization to which I am affiliated, the Illinois Green Party will be presenting two candidates for the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. So that's on um, the 23rd. On April the 30th, here's truly Charles Paydock, We'll be discussing, examining the situation regarding the forest and trees of the United States. And I have proof that there is an endangered, there's a relic hominid species residing in those forests. That's on April the 30th. Don't miss it. Is it called on May the Communist? The, <clears throat> on May the 7th, we're going to have our annual May Day speaker. And we got a big shot. This is the National General Secretary of the AIWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, to which I am affiliated, a member in good standing. You were talking about labor militants. Uh, anyhow, that should be a good program to discuss the condition of uh, labor in the United States. On May the 14th, the Truth Brigade will be here. They have a method of, of ascertaining what is truth and what is false, what is fiction. And I think you guys really need to be listen to them. Anyhow, that's um, on the 14th. On the 21st, we're gonna be looking at uh, health disparities regarding the pandemic and taking a look at the situation regarding long COVID, a serious situation. On, on uh, May the 28th, uh, we're going to be discussing efforts to curtail, uh, such as the, um, the critical race theory and uh, procedures in schools. This is still a current issue regarding COVID. On May the 28th, there's conflicting forces. Uh, regarding what should be the policy that's up, that adopted. And we've just added on May the, on June the 4th, um, 
we're going to listen to uh, our own Professor Bob Lichtenberg. We'll tell you how to add meaning to your life. He's got tips and suggestions. So basically, this will be an evening for the discussion of philosophy. Okay, yeah. that's about it. Uh, if anyone's interested, there is a meeting on a Zoom meeting on Monday at seven o'clock from the Chicago and Cook County Green Party. If you wish to be affiliated with a dynamic political organization. Okay, Tim, that's it. Oh, by the way, the next open dates are June 11, 18, and 25. Take it away, Tim. All right, thanks. Well, I guess we're ready to hit you uh, starting, uh, Dan, if you want to take it away and uh, go ahead and give us your uh, spiel tonight about the Libertarian Party and why you want to <laughs> be a uh, Illinois Attorney General, I'd love to hear about it. Very good. Uh, are you going to put up the uh, I can the put website? the website up. I can do it right now for you. It doesn't matter, but it, it, as long as you can do that, it's okay. Well, I, I'll, I'll, I'd rather hear you speak, and then we can do it during some of the points where you're ready to go to it, but I'll show it, I'll show it now. Okay. Here, give me a second here. I'll put it up. Just take a minute here. Uh, I'm uh, sure they just don't worry about it. Let's let's skip over that. <laughs> well, we can do it towards the end of your presentation and show you where to go and everything. Okay. Anyway, I want to say thank you to the College of Complexes for uh, inviting me to speak. I also want to say thank you to the NCAA for delaying the Final Four during my speech. Uh. My name is Dan Robin. Uh, I have been a practicing attorney for 45 years. I retired last August, and I am currently the candidate for Illinois Attorney General on the Libertarian Party ticket. I'm also an author of a book entitled The Libertarian War on Poverty, Repairing the Ladder of Upward Mobility. Uh, in that book, I present the statistical conclusion based upon uh, the longitudinal studies that over a, a lifetime, economic mobility is alive and well. The greatest impediments to upward mobility is government regulation. Life is never perfect uh, and bad stuff happens to us, but people along with their family and friends and neighbors are generally pretty resourceful clever and hardworking. If we get out of their way, poverty hopefully will be each individual's moment in their rearview mirror. I reside in Schaumburg with my wife. My two other interests are tennis and triathlon. The purpose of my talk is to discuss the relationship between voting and the constitutional right of free speech. The reason I wrote this is because I disagree with the United States Supreme Court on the issue. The most popular and most acceptable theory of the free speech is that it was created to support the democratic process. The people should always have the right to discuss the issues of the day in such a way that our laws reflect public opinion. The government has no power to restrict such speech based upon its content. Somehow, that simple rule has never been applied to the voting process. Amazingly enough, the court has held that Picking your representative is not speech. I disagree. So why is this an issue? Something just seems wrong if you have no one to vote for and no candidate really represents how you think. The First Amendment protects your right to say anything on any issue 
or can it? Until the very moment when you enter the voting booth. Just an extreme example. In 2002, Saddam Hussein received 100% of the vote. No one else was allowed to be on the ballot. As you can see, government control of the contents of a ballot affects free speech. In America, until the 1880s, people brought their own ballot to the polling booth. You could pick up your own pencil and vote for anybody in the world. Plus, there was little or no privacy. Actually, there was a very famous voting jar. It was made out of glass, so everyone could see what your ballot looked like. There were lots of problems prior to the 1880s. Lots of vote buying. Politicians either bought you lunch, bought you a beer, or gave you money. But in return, they handed you their colored ballot. And they would stand there to make sure that the correct ballot went into the glass jar. By the way, the ballot they handed you looked like a train ticket. That's in fact where we get the expression, voting the party ticket. Back then actually things were a lot worse. There are lots of stories about physical fights. If you were seen carrying the wrong color ballot to the voting window, you were taking your life in your hand. The literature is full of horror stories about landlords uh, and employers making sure that the vote went their way. I suspect that all the parties did the same thing. It was kind of standard behavior. Most of the problems prior to the 1880s involved the absence of a secret ballot. I really do like the idea of a secret ballot. Some people will disagree with me on that. Uh, today, we still have a form of outcry. The, the Iowa has their caucus system where you vote by walking to one side of the room or another. Uh, to solve the secret ballot issue, the government seemingly had to get into the business of supplying the ballot itself. In the 1880s, we adopted what's called the Australian ballot. Voting became private. The government assumed monopoly control over the drafting and contents of the ballot. The goal certainly was stopping fraud and violence, and that seemed good. Uh, this was instituted with the absolute best of intentions. What could possibly go wrong? Virtually the entire country adopted the Australian ballot. And some 30 years later, things began to change. Immediately after World War I, the country experienced the Red Scare. Lots of people wanted to keep the commies out. So what they did was they tried to limit ballot access. Lots of different methods of doing that. One example might be helpful. In 1933, Claude Lightfoot, no relation, got, thir got 33,000 votes. In the Hello? Okay. Uh, got 33,000 votes for the Communist Party in the city of Chicago. As a result, the state of Illinois immediately changed the number of signatures required on a petition from 1,000 to 25,000. Problem solved. The commies were kept off the ballot. 
<clears throat> Politicians learn from their success. They learn not just to keep one party off, but to keep virtually everyone off the ballot. I'm not saying that ballot access was the only problem with voting. There have certainly been plenty of issues. Many of the problems are long since gone. Our country has seen amazing advances in civil rights. Women have had the right to vote since 1920. African Americans have had the right to vote since 1870. The poll tax is gone. Literacy tests are gone. I rejoice at our civil rights advances and the fact that our society remains vigilant. But in stark contrast, ballot access is a mess. As Bill Redpath, our candidate for United States Senate has said, if you as a new party wanted to run in all 17 United States House districts, all 118 Illinois House districts, 59 Senate districts, you would need 1 million signatures acquired within 90 days. In addition, voting districts look like deep sea creatures. The results are clear. In 60% of Illinois districts, candidates run unopposed. Voting is meaningless. This should be the civil rights issue of our day. But where's the outrage? We scream at each other on social media, but engage in meaningless charade on election day. Given the millions of different opin opinions we all have, we should be allowed to express ourselves by the candidates we vote for. Let's move on to my constitutional issue. I'm a strong believer that rights are rights. One is as good as another. We formed government to protect the rights of the people. The Declaration of Independence says that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Our Ninth Amendment says that enumeration of rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage other rights retained by the people. But that's not the world we live in. Economic rights and property rights are treated like some distant relative. If you challenge in court a regulation that impinges on our economic rights, the government doesn't have to prove anything. It's called rational basis review. And the judge can literally make up something to uphold the constitutionality. Freedom of speech is different. A regulation that restricts speech based upon its content is subject to strict scrutiny. Under that standard, the government must carry the burden of proof that the regulation is the least restrictive necessary to accomplish a compelling state interest. These differences are real and important. Challenge an economic regulation and the judge could easily talk about a dream he or she had last night challenge a regulation of speech, and the judge will turn to the government lawyer and say, call your first witness, prove your case. 
So how do the courts, in fact, talk about our right to vote? Maybe close your eyes and listen to how the Supreme Court describes the right to vote. In Williams versus Rhodes, it said, the First Amendment equals the right to associate to advance political beliefs. Voters have a right to vote effectively. No right is more precious in a free country than that of having a voice in the election of those who make the laws under which, as good citizens, we must live. In Reynolds versus Sims, the court said, the right to vote is personal. The right to vote involves one of the basic civil rights of man. Suffrage is a fundamental matter. The right to elect legislators in a free, an unimpaired fashion is a bedrock of po our political system. So how are the courts actually treating this bedrock of a right? It is a million miles away from strict scrutiny. The court applies a balancing test. Listen to the language of Burdick versus Takushi, the court will weigh the character and magnitude of the asserted injury to the rights against the precise interest put forward by the state as justification for the burden imposed by this rule. These are mamsy pamsy balancing rules. Let's look at the consequences of our free speech rules. Look at the cases. Note the scope of what is protected as speech. In the commercial area, we have a right to sell X for the price of Y. In political speech, burning the American flag is protected. Wearing a jacket says, that says, fuck the draft. Restrictions on campaign signs, restrictions on campaign money. <laughs> Generalized speech is protected too. Movies, hate speech, selling information, parade themes, even train schedules, all of these protected. Any restrictions on those, on that speech, it's a dead loser. <clears throat> Again, listen to the language of strict scrutiny. A government has no power to restrict expression because of its, con its message, its ideas, its subject matter, or its content. Content-based laws are presumptively unconstitutional and may be justified only if the government proves that they are narrowly tailored to serve a compelling state interest. Now that's how to protect the rights of the people. So we're getting close to my main argument. Voting is speech. But not one justice of the Supreme Court comes out and agrees with my thesis that the right to vote should be treated like speech and that any regulation of voting should be subjected to strict scrutiny. So where and how do we differ? Under modern First Amendment law, it is now well accepted that the right to receive speech or communication is protected. In contrast, most courts refer to voting as merely an event for the election of representatives. Sure, they recognize voting as communicating a preference for candidates, but that seems to be as far 
as they go. I like to think that I take it one step further. Voting and speech involve the right to receive information, to put a pin on it. It is my belief that the Supreme Court has erred by failing to recognize the extent to which voting is a form of speech because of the public's right to hear the opinions of voters. Maybe I'll be clearer with a few examples of actual Supreme Court cases on the right to receive information. In Stanley versus Georgia, the cops thought that Robert Eli Stanley was a bookie. They got a search warrant for his house, and during that search, they found he had three eight millimeter sexually explicit films, charged him with a crime. The court held that he had the right to receive information regardless of its social value. In 1976, Ralph Nader's consumer organization went to court to protect the right of the elderly to receive price information concerning pharmaceutical drugs. He won the right of consumers to hear price information. The court didn't just protect the right of the merchant to advertise. They weren't even a part of the case. The court protected the consumer's right to hear the advertisements. The right to receive communication applies to voting. Sure, the voter has a right to communicate a preference at the polls, but that's not what I'm talking about. Please consider the image of election night. I don't know about you, but I'm in front of the TV most of the evening. Election night is all about listeners. The public listens. The candidates listen. The campaign workers listen. Many broadcast networks stop all their other programming and show election results all night. What are they listening for? Voting results. Who won? Who lost? Nuance. What's new in the trends? What's changing? What's popular? How did the cities vote? How did the young people vote? What about the farmer vote? What's that all about? It's the right to hear messages, ideas, subject matter, and content from election results. Furthermore, pundits, political scientists, further analyze this stuff forever. It's absurd to describe voting as merely the process of picking public officials. Voters vote and the people listen. But if the government restricts who we can vote for, we're listening to garbage. Saddam Hussein wins. What a great headline. Who cares? Maybe I've misled you a little. The Supreme Court has clearly used words that infers a relationship between voting and speech. But remember, as I described them, none have carried the day. In Reynolds versus Sims, the court said, each citizen must have an equally effective voice in the election. In Norman versus Reed, the court said, voting gives opportunities to all voters to express their own political preferences. Yet not one justice of the Supreme Court has concluded that voting is speech protected by the First Amendment. 
Well, I hope by this point you might agree with me that voting is a form of speech which is protected by the First Amendment. Any regulation of speech must withstand strict scrutiny. Of course, there are exceptions. There's always exceptions. Uh, in speech's case, uh, they can regulate time, place, and manner. Plus, the Constitution is quite explicit on voting. Article 1, Section 4 says the time, place, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. Also, we know that some voting regulations simply don't impact the speech right. There are many rules that simply don't, don't, aren't relevant. Generally, we can skip over these rules pretty quickly. The rules might say election night shall be on the second Tuesday of November, or voting shall be on paper or by a machine. Uh, they might regulate which block or which building the voting booth is in. These don't involve speech. There are many issues and laws discussed in the 2020 election cycle that we talked about. I doubt that many of them implicated any real impact on the ability of voters to express themselves. Voter ID, drop boxes, deadlines for mail-in ballots. By contrast, if a candidate is barred from a ballot, that impacts the speech rights of 100% of the voters and the entire listening public. The government has been very creative in how it restricts ballot access. These include the number of signatures on a ballot petition or early deadlines for candidate applications. Subjecting these ballot access rules to strict scrutiny demonstrates how poorly they are justified. Many of the restrictions will fail. When it comes time to prove the validity of the claimed state interest, it is a daunting task to call your first witness to prove the veracity of the justification of her restriction. For example, of course we want fair elections and honest elections, but can anybody prove the election wasn't fair because one or 10 candidates got on the ballot? Of course we want informed citizens <coughs> and informed candidates. Voter confusion, ballot chaos, and frustration of the democratic process sound and are very important concepts. But proof is impossible to come by. In the 2016 election, there were 29 announced democratic candidates for president. In 2016, there were 17 Republican presidential candidates. No one even mentioned ballot chaos. Maybe if there were 50 or 100 candidates, someone may have gotten confused. I can't imagine finding a witness to prove that the people or candidates are 2% or 10% more or less informed about each other. One of my pet peeves is the government claiming it can't do this or that with a ballot because it would cost too much. Really? The government spends billions and trillions and they can't afford to hold a general election with a larger piece of paper? My second pet peeve is that the government should never be in the business 
of picking winners and losers. I don't think that the government has any business helping the two major part political parties. Stability of the two party system shouldn't even be relevant. Political parties are private entities and they can't, if they can't work out their own membership rules or their candidates rules, why should the government come to their rescue? And especially if the rules to help them is restricting speech. And for sure, protecting the two major parties is not a compelling state interest. The final piece to strict scrutiny is probably the most important and would have the greatest impact on current public policy. This one asks the question, whether the policy is the least restrictive of liberty, or in this case, free speech. I like democracy, but as Churchill said, it's the worst of all systems except for all of the others. The biggest problem I have with democracy is that all too often, it seems like two wolves and a chicken discussing what's for dinner. We call this tyranny of the majority. But if there is anything worse, it would be tyranny of the minority. Of course, having three, four, five candidates increases the chances of a small minority or plurality winning an election. Having major parties splintering can be unstable and lead to minority rule. Do these fears justify laws that keep candidates off a of ballot? Does it justify requiring a candidate to obtain 5% of the prior year's votes as signatures on a petition like Illinois does to show a modicum of support? I think not. You cannot violate people's right to freely express themselves at the ballot box and prevent the public from hearing these voices if there is a system that accomplishes the same goals, but doesn't violate the freedom of speech. That system is expressed in two parts. Universal ballot access and ranked choice voting. Universal ballot access says that you should have little or no requirement to have your name or party on a ballot. Of course, if you can prove the existence of actual voter chaos, say 50 or 100 candidates, then institute the minimum number of signatures to avoid that chaos. Start small, say 0.1%. If that doesn't work, try 0.2% and so on. Ranked choice voting. So what's that? Ranked choice voting works like this. If there are three candidates, you vote for your first, your second, and your third choice. If no one gets a majority, the last place finisher is dropped and his or her second place votes are then allocated until someone gets a majority. Voila! Or as my wife says, echo. Majority rule and free speech preserved. 
ballot astra ballot access restrictions fail strict scrutiny because universal ballot access and ranked choice voting are less restrictive of liberty. My last topic is gerrymandering. That's the uh, deep sea creature of politics. Does anyone really think that voting districts are designed for any other reason than to control the results of your vote and to control the results of your speech? There is a system that is less restrictive of speech. It's called cumulative voting and eliminating districts. How does it work? If there are le seven legislative offices to fill, everyone can vote for seven different people or they can vote seven times for the same person. We don't need districts. My campaign issues are three. Allow universal ballot access. Institute ranked choice voting. And gerrymandering with cumulative voting. These are the civil rights issues of our day. Free speech law can make it happen. As your attorney general, I will not allow the government to violate your right to freedom of speech in your right to vote and the freedom to hear the vote of the people. In honor of the Illinois 5% signature rule, I'm asking you to do three things. Well, vote Libertarian, sign a petition putting Libertarians on the ballot, and donate five bucks to my campaign. With Dan, you can. So who's winning the final four? Anyway, I should do that. Would you like it? Kansas Villanova? Yeah, three minutes, three and a half minutes to go. Uh, Kansas is up by 12. Can't, yeah, that's what I expected. They were up by 11 at half. Seventy-one to 59. Sorry for uh, breaking protocol. <laughs> Any questions? Any comments? Hi, Nico. Tim, you are muted. I have a question. Hi, Dan. Go ahead and ask a question. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Justin, go ahead. Uh, Dan, uh, excellent talk. Uh, thanks for uh, coming to the college. Uh, really enjoyed uh, what you just said. It was very passionate. Um, and I never heard of the, the no districts thing. That's pretty cool. Um, I've heard it, some libertarians argue that term limits are also a limitation on free speech. Um, do you agree or disagree with that? Oh, I how can you disagree? Uh, it has aspects of, of speech. Now, if you were, let, let's say you consider uh, term limits as a regulation of speech, and you're subjecting that regulation to strict scrutiny. Well, first of all, you know, uh, the government is going to turn around and say, well, that's what our constitution says. Um, how can you, you can't, you, you can't say that the current system is 
violative of the First Amendment when it is the Constitution which tells you how many times or can't run for office. So I don't think it's going anywhere. I mean, you know, uh, if they were to say you, you can't vote for somebody past two uh, terms in office, I don't think that if that's in the Constitution, no one's going to say it was unconstitutional. Actually, it is in the Constitution. <laughs> Uh, Kelvin has a question, and then I have a question. All right, Kelvin, go ahead, and then uh, okay. Um, we'll uh, your I. Okay. I've got to say, I, I do disagree with your original premise in the start from libertarian and the fact that the greatest restriction to what mobility is um, regulation. Um, unfortunately, I think you got it wrong there. And I will take the analogy of sport for a start. Uh, originally, football was one village against the other. Everybody pushing against each other. Every, 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 you, you made the church wall in the other village, you won, right? No regulation whatsoever. You will knock at a Tom Brady or a David Beckham in the, under that situation. Also, you will knock at a Tom Brady or a David Beckham if they, if they grow up with rickets, which is generally down to the regulations you've got when you eat bread. Because if you have a look at a slice of bread in America or in Britain, there will be vitamins added to that bread, and that's part of the regulations. And that's the reason why you've got kids running around, not hobbling around, okay? All right. So, on that same vein, you didn't come, it didn't touch on the subject of when you talk about free speech and, and elections. The Supreme Court judgment that a corporation is, uh, is, is, uh, has the same rights as an individual when it comes to free speech in the elections. And the result is, that you can say uh, all your things about libertarian each one. You can get yourself on the ballot, but you haven't got a snowflake in hell's chance of ever getting elected. What's the question? Because you, got, because you haven't got because you haven't got money. So why haven't you tackled the problem of big corporation money in elections and possibly the regulation of how much money you can put into an election to try and make it a fairer, fair, uh, more level playing field? I have the same fears about the unions having so much money as in the state of Illinois, you can't get anybody else elected unless you're a Democrat. So, uh, yeah, I, I, have, I have a lot of concerns about uh, money in politics. Uh, I think that uh, as libertarians, we know we're up against it. The, uh, the, uh, the two major parties have all the money and we don't have as much. I don't think it's a, a, a corporate issue. There's lots of money out there. Um, and it's going to be expressing itself. Well, it's, it's not just a, it, it, it's a, it, you know, every, from what I understand of American politics, the lobbyists in, Amer in, in uh, the, you know, you're mostly politicians uh, are subservient mostly to their, their corporate donors to get, to get them elected. They're not subservient, they don't, they don't represent the people and, and, and they, and they, they, they were upset. They, I, have they, no, I have no clue why you're limiting to corporate people who lobby. Everybody well, lobbies. Yes, Everybody but the corporates, lobbies. Yes, but the corporates have got enough money to get you elected, Mace. Oh, everybody has the right. The Democrats have their corporations. The Republicans have their yes, corporations. Yes, of course. I've got, I, I'm not being party political about this. Well, uh, I don't know. I uh, well, you be, every every single election, American election, it's like this. You know this. You know G, Dupont or Coca Cola or whatever <laughs> pay pay huge amounts of money for an advert, and this is approved by you know so, uh, yeah, but uh, Donald Trump or Joe Biden approves this advert, right? And you know, there's a lot of what, money sloshing around. Yeah, um, why not bring in regulation to to limit that amount of money? Because that's the limitation of speech, and I don't like that. And so you get a representative that somebody else paid for, not you. True. Ah, okay. Live with it then. Okay. Yep. So now uh, next up is uh, Adam Bowling. Yeah. Then we go to Charlie. Then we go to Ellen. Okay. I mean, it, 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 unless you were first, Ellen. I'd like to go after that. Um... All right, then I'll up with that. Close automatically. Come on, Tim. Follow All the right. 
All right, Adam. Just, just uh, Adam, you're next. There's some problem with following the order. All right. I'll, 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 I'll try and keep it fast. And as I said in the chat, corporate donors or for that matter, AFL-CIO donors don't have to try that hard if they keep the other challengers off the ballot to begin with. And that's key. But uh, I was going to ask, because I came of age as a voter um, after we had gone from some, some of the changes in Illinois politics that I didn't really live through. And I was going to ask Dan to comment on those, because I know that county commissioner elections used to be at large until they went to districts beginning with the 1994 election cycle. And I believe that was court ordered. And some of the office holders, including John P. Daly in the 11th district and Peter Silvestri, who is not running for reelection, but they've held office since 1994 in those seats. I also know that there used to be multiple member districts for the state Senate in Illinois, but that that changed with the 1980 constitution, I believe. Uh, was there anything better before we went to single member districts um, in either of those cases in, in your experience as an Illinoisan, Dan? I, I wish I could answer your question. I was thrilled to hear your question with the history, but I really, I have, I have no knowledge of, the, uh, of that history. All right, I'll take my hand down. Okay. Go ahead, Charlie. Yes, uh, uh, Robin, you said over and over again, you're a strong advocate of free speech. Now, a person signing a petition, in effect, is saying, I want this person to be on the ballot. They're exercising their speech. So, and then you seem to be opposed to that aspect of free speech. And do you feel that you, this is an onerous burden to get a small percentage of people to say you should be on the ballot? I mean, I've dealt on endorsement committees and there's absolute lunatics who show up. Nope. And they can't get, lucky if they could get one I, person I, to I, say I they be should lunatic. be on the ballot I might outside be of lunatic. themselves. And you are opposed to that form of free speech? As I said. You like I, your, you don't like that speech. Okay. Uh, there are several different questions. I hope I heard them. I, I apologize. I have this bad habit of chiming in before people finish their questions. Now go ahead. Uh, okay. So first of all, it is a regulation limiting the right of the voters to have anybody on a ballot that wants to be on a ballot. No believe, right is exercised in the absolute. You don't have an absolute right to be on a ballot. Why not? As, as no right Why? can be exercised in the absolute. Why? Why? Yeah. <laughs> Simply because it would be bad. For at least so much on free speech, our free speech is restricted everywhere we go. But can there's, it, the there's so much written the, about that? The question is whether it's harmful to society. The question I believe that you're posing is whether the government can restrict its voting procedural methods by limiting the speech of the voters and limiting what the public can hear about who the public wants. If you voting. can't get enough people to say you should be, all you have to do is- How many questions get, do uh, people get people, will you let in a round? Uh, you can't convince a number of people to say you should be on the ballot. That's all you have to do. But but what for what purpose? To be what's, on the ballot. Why? What what's the purpose of limiting yourself access? gave it because there would there's like two hundred people run for president. You can't okay. have a ballot. It would make that's them, exact, they would that's, destroy the system. That's exactly what I covered. Yes. It's, it's so exact. there has to be some 
some filtering process. Okay. And the, I'm saying the filtering process okay. is simply condensing people to exercise. How many questions do people get? Can Charlie get tell us that they're in the uh, rebuttal or something? Like a tenth of a Charlie, percent instead of 5%, of Charlie? Earlier? That fell of the rules. Freeze them, well, well, uh, let's right, move on. To, all right, Ellen, let's get move on to Ellen. He didn't answer the question yet. All right, go all ahead right. and answer the question. Okay. It would be the government's burden. Okay. Hi. Um, It'd be the government. Wait, Ellen. We're finishing up with Charlie, and then we'll go to you. Go ahead. It would be yeah. the government's burden of proving actual ballot chaos. They would have to present a witness on a witness stand to prove that the voters were confused by the existence of 50 candidates. Oh, come but if on. The, what's wrong with having to prove something you're you're standing there saying you know best but what you're not saying is by what standard do we judge this and i say the government bears the burden of proof that its rules are necessary in fact you want to arbitrarily say, I know best. Ellen, thanks. You're next. Yeah. You don't want any thresholds. Okay, Charlie, we'll, we'll get back to you, all right? That's Ellen, gloomy. go ahead. Yeah. Well. Okay, hi. Um, I'm Ellen, and here's my question. <laughs> um, <laughs> if I could jump in there. Charlie can save his for rebuttals. <clears throat> um, I, uh, I like your talk. Thank you. And... Um, what and I like the premise of the I, I I'm not a hundred percent sure what strict scrutiny is, but it that's part of the question. But it I'm a market researcher, and I think the the argument needs to be made before the Supreme Court that that the way you know I you can have choice sampling, you know, to which is what we have now. It's like if you want the least worst choice than a candidate, or you could have a system that really, it's, we got two parties that are kind of the same. The issues aren't representative, no matter who, and it seems to be getting worse, you know, that they're more, they're more uh, picked by, uh, you know, corporate special interests. And um, I, it really is surprising because I grew up a, you know, Republican family and could never re really win an argument that the, when I finally came out of the closet and became a left-wing Democrat, um, I found that there was, uh, it was just as corrupt, really. And um, I also was on the Green Party and they blackballed me with just four people. I was on the ballot because of some weird, you know, pandemic rule. They said the head of the party in Quigley's district could just be on the ballot. But Charlie and- What's the question? 10 other Jewish people uh, pushed me off. And so I'm, I'm wondering as a candidate, a libertarian, which should ideally be almost like an anarchist, a completely representative. I do, I, you know, I would question That's how true. you can say that, that it's down between the unions and the corporations and you choose the corporations because that's what libertarians do. That would be my question. I mean, is that free speech? I don't think so coming down between corporations or versus unions, you know, and, and just let's balance out the power. I think also federalism is the problem, uh, you know, and I don't see why it's not all done at the federal level, rather than this, it's very, it's a convenient rigging of the game to say- Hey, what's the question? At the state level. Let, let and I don't know as an question. attorney general what you could do about it, but you know, good luck. Let him, let him answer the question, Ellen. Question. Okay. That was a question. What, what can you is. do about any of this other than win the election and, uh, you know, stand up for libertarians? I, I think it sounds like it's just a little more corruption. I mean, how All would right. you answer? Ideally, an anarchist libertarian would free speech would really be free speech. But I don't think 
right, don't think Ellen, the Libertarian well, Party uh, system uh, is uh, really uh, representative. Answer, Ellen. Thank you. Okay. So I think your basic question is what am I going to do if elected uh, with regard to uh, the voting process? And quite frankly, uh, as, as Attorney General, I don't have the authority to do anything. Uh, I would have the, the right if the, if the state, if somebody in the state of Illinois filed a lawsuit against uh. the state of Illinois with the allegation being that its voting system was unconstitutional because the voting system violated the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. I would take the position as the top legal officer of the state to say, you're right. Our current system does violate currently the rights of the people to speak at the voting booth and the rights of the people to hear the results of people's vote. That's my answer. Or, or do I have the right to get on the ballot? I get past hey, the corruption. Hey, you, you can uh, ask party. another question in another round. All right. Well, it was, a, it was a follow up to a question um, that I don't think he fully understood the right to get on the ballot, the okay. right of an individual. That's it's not just voting. For all, right, all right, Ellen, let him answer the have question. Everybody has an equal chance to get on the ballot. He doesn't understand that you can run as an independent. So, my opinion. Is how many how many signatures right, Ellen, do you need him, for let that? Him, uh, let him finish. Charlie, shut up. Uh, it, Why? There, Why there, should I? <laughs> he doesn't understand bullying. He can run as an independent. One Good. full at a time, Charlie. Let Dan answer the question, okay? He didn't answer it. Well, yes, and that's because you're not giving a chance. Go ahead, Dan. My first proposition is to allow universal ballot access. That means allow anybody and everybody that wants to be on the ballot to be on the ballot. It would be the government's burden of proving that such a universal system caused actual physical chaos. If they did carry that burden of proof, then we would have to institute the absolute bare minimum number of signatures, like I said, 0.1% of the vote or 0.2% of the vote as a petition to get on a ballot. But you require proof first. Anyway, thank you. All right, go ahead, Brian. Go ahead, Brian Dohany, if you're up. So, um, so I, I ran for as a libertarian here in Cook County, and the only reason I eventually did get on the, the ballot was because um, no one challenged me. Like my ballot was presumptively correct, you know, or my filing. <clears throat> so the only reason I got on was that we were. I just wasn't challenged. Um, and now we've run into the issue where in the upcoming election, um, the next signature gathering period. So in this election, we have a very low signature threshold because it was based on, I got more than 5%. So it's how much of the vote I got, which was 150,000. So everybody's ballot signature requirements are based on that. But in the next election, you know, our candidates are likely going to receive significantly more votes. We have more of them. Um, you know, they're starting earlier. So someone and they're and they're running in, in you know, two party or, you know, it it's them and another candidate. So like the ballot access issue is such a burden to democracy and, and freedom and the idea of the consent of the governed. And a, and a person's voice in their government. 
because you have to overcome this tremendous burden to get on the ballot. And why is it so difficult to get on the ballot? And I, and I agree with your, uh, you know, your legal conclusion of a strict scrutiny standard um, that may solve the problem. I mean, if, if this was, you know, analyzed, you know, from the, the judges from a position of strict scrutiny and a minimum intrusion on the, the rights of the, of the person, the citizen to participate in their elections, um, then these laws couldn't exist. And, and so I really respect your, um, you know, that, that's, that's a very nuanced legal position that I think would really solve a lot of problems. I mean, when it comes to just the access of the people to the, to, you know, the political process. So, so other than that, when, when you, you know, would as attorney general, you have the, so I ran for state attorney and state attorney would How have had discretion. Question? And I'm getting to the question there, Charlie. Then in my so, lifetime. Hey, hey. <laughs> one, one commie at a time, Charlie. <laughs> Come on, uh, ask a question. So, but it, so the Illinois state attorney would have, um, you know, like absolute discretion over what cases to prosecute, which ones to not. So my position was that to the extent of my lawful authority, I wouldn't prosecute drug cases and other types of um, crimes in which there is no actual victim. Um, and, and that would have been within my authority to do. Get your question, As attorney please. general, would you have similar authority? Like what kind of positions would you take in, in like I, I would imagine you would have tremendous authority to do a lot of things that could right away improve the lives of people and, and what would you do? Okay. Um, Unfortunately, as I read uh, our Illinois Constitution, the Illinois Attorney General is charged with the responsibility of mostly defending the government and its agencies. Uh, I don't think that I would have authority. I know I would not have authority to go in and regulate the state's attorney's office, the police departments uh, uh, throughout the state. It just, it's not there. However, I've looked at the current attorney general's website and he makes it a regular process, procedure that he follows by going around the state and talking to the various police departments and attorney and, and prosecutor's offices. And I would do the same thing. I might, I might recommend for your consideration an organization called Thick Red Line. They have a very simple motto, no victim, no crime. What, and what they do is they lobby they go around to police departments and lobby and say, please officers, would you please consider the idea of, within your discretion of limiting your activities only to those matters where there are actual victims? I think that's my answer to your question. Yeah, thank you. All right. We'll skip over Charlie this time and go straight to Frank and Margaret. Okay, I, I actually have a similar question. I know that some attorneys Next, general, some attorneys general in, in other states, and I think Illinois Attorney General came out in favor of um, of the Equal Rights Amendment being added to the Constitution as um, as a um, an amendment. And I wondered, what, would you do things like that? And what is your position specifically on the ERA? Uh, <laughs> tough question. Uh, I, I don't know that I have a, a really good opinion on that. I heard a tremendous, tremendous <coughs> podcast on the subject of the proposed uh, equal rights amendment that it would literally diminish 
the rights of women if passed. Um, so I'm, I, I think maybe I'll just shut up because uh, I don't know <laughs> enough about it. Okay, Charlie. Yeah, Robin, I was a civil service employee. And civil service employees have a responsibility for enforcement or application of the law. And you, they, we're not members of a legislature. We're not members of a voting body. Aren't you come confusing the office of a, a, an attorney for the state of Illinois has a political agenda that is the proper uh, domain of the legislature? You're running for the wrong office. You have no authority to introduce legislation. I'm not interested. Introducing... There's no mechanism for it. Okay. So, Charlie, is your question whether I have authority as attorney general to yeah. introduce, to introduce they, legislation? I've heard, well, I've heard several times over and over that these are voting laws. <laughs> and the legislative assembly passes the laws. Correct. And you're not a member of it. Correct. What's your question? Well, what does I don't understand your campaign. You 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 want to do something, but you're precluded from okay. doing it. Okay, let me let me. It's repeat. not part of your job, Charlie. Let, let me repeat what I think I said about five minutes ago. In the event that a citizen of the state of Illinois were to file a lawsuit against the state of Illinois making the allegation that the current voting system is unconstitutional under the First Amendment. I would be, as the top legal officer for the state, charged with the responsibility of participating in that lawsuit, and I would agree with that lawsuit <clears throat> that it is currently, as currently structured, a violation of the people's First Amendment rights. Follow up. You have no rights, such veto right. What? You have to you have to enforce the laws as given. It's not your choice. Hey Charlie, save this for the rebuttal. Let me that's just a follow-up, Justin. You don't need he to no follow up. You have a rebuttal the period of the state of Illinois. Just As attorney general, I am, would be charged with the responsibility of defending lawsuits against the state of Illinois. And I would take the position as I've described. Okay, uh, Justin, you got a question? Can be a fun question, uh, Dan. Do you have a favorite movie, and what is it? Oh Jesus! Uh, since I have such a terrible memory, uh, I'm going to go with the ones that I've seen most recently. Major League, it's a baseball show. Uh, oh yeah, that's a good one. Could I? <laughs> Ask a follow-up. Bob Matters next. Yeah, Dan. Um, well, I'm I'm from Indiana, and <clears throat> so I'm not that familiar with uh, all of uh, Indi Illinois's uh, legal rules. But does the uh, does the Attorney General in Illinois have any say over what Kim Fox does? No. How's that for an answer? No. You answered the question. <laughs> Done. And go IU. <laughs> okay. Les, you're next, and then uh, right. Les, you're next. Uh, Dan, my question to you is: is how much uh, time have you spent, if you know, going over and through uh, the existing, the current Attorney General, his his platform and policy positions, his website? You know, basically your opposition research to understand him and, and, and you know, past cases that he's, you know, 
worked over or, or, or you know looked at in, in the, his past couple of years. It's a hard two days. So, uh, less uh, very good question. <laughs> no. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I've always spent a minimum amount of time. Uh, if I if we get through this petitioning period where I'm actually on the ballot, I'll probably spend a little extra time. Uh, However, let me do answer what I have gone over. And that is that I believe the current Illinois Attorney General participated in a lawsuit against those institutions charged with the responsibility for collecting student loans. And I don't know what, <coughs> excuse me, I don't know how much time he put into that, but he sure got a, a lot of headlines that, and they settled their case. I, I sat down with a pencil and paper. They got $240 per person. Big friggin' deal. That's what our attorney general is doing one quick follow-up question so you would say that his uh role as an attorney general was a letdown to those students who uh were cheated by those no, uh, institutions there there was no admission of any cheating uh lack of a better word sorry yeah i or, i i think i think these lawsuits against student loan people lawsuits against uh medical providers lawsuits against uh manufacturers of guns uh most of these are political lawsuits to get attention for the current attorney general and have little or no uh help for the people I, I should keep my mouth shut because i don't know about most of them so dan and lana next okay go ahead okay yeah i'm going i'm going um uh, i guess you're probably you're familiar with the laws and Georgia, Texas. No, you don't know about those at all, about the election laws? No? Oh, the ones where Coca-Cola and all of them were, were complaining. Uh, I mean, I read the newspapers. Yeah. I read the right. newspapers. Well, you don't have an opinion on those. Uh, I, I covered them ever, ever so briefly right. in my talk. And what I said was, that all of these laws, you know, where are the voting booths? When do you have to return the uh, the, the absentee ballots? Uh, how how when when do you have to mail all this stuff in? Um, uh, whether or not you have to have a, a an ID. Uh, I heard a really really good podcast. Uh, by some legal experts saying that all of those laws of all of their description affect less than 1% of the, of, of, of the vote. Uh, most of the main arguments against these laws is that they're keeping poor and minorities away from the ballot. Well, the proof is in the pudding there. The number of minority votes is skyrocketing. So I, you know, social media screamed and yelled about all those little, when do you have to mail in your ballot and when does it have to be counted and, and all that stuff. And it has almost no okay. impact. Okay, okay. 
I have another follow-up question. Sure. As far, as far as free speech, uh, President Trump was taken off of Twitter and Facebook or something. And, but there are also left-wing people who have been taken off of Twitter and YouTube and things like that. So do you see when, uh, when you're Attorney General of Illinois, are you going to sue uh, Twitter and Facebook and YouTube uh, for free speech? Or can they, are they private corporations and they can act like a person and they can do what they want? Have an answer? Yeah. Um, Ninety-eight percent of my answer is that they're private organizations. Uh -huh. uh, Two percent of my answer uh -huh. says that some private organizations, when so compelled by government action, are taking, are making decisions and taking actions because they're yeah, being forced to do so by government. Maybe then, but they've got a ton of proof to show that the government is forcing the private hands of those companies. And, and quite frankly, hauling their executives in front of Congress and berating them is part of what might subject them to a First Amendment challenge. Uh, but I don't think there are any, le any realistic challenge exists, if that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Joseph, go ahead. Joseph, go ahead. He's muted. I know. Well, thanks. Thanks, Tim. Um, Dan, <clears throat> my question is on the qualifying signature requirement for ballot access and petitioning. Mm -hmm. Did you say that there is no US constitutional basis for such a requirement? Or did you say that it explicitly violates the US Constitution? Okay. Uh, ball Thank you for your question. Uh, ballot access restrictions, such as the Illinois law requiring 5% from the prior election are restraints on speech. And as such, I believe they are subject to the requirements of the First Amendment, which is strict scrutiny. Strict scrutiny requires <clears throat> that the government prove by actual evidence that its laws are the least restrictive of liberty. And I don't believe the 5% requirements for ballot access would pass strict scrutiny. Okay, a follow up. So, does that mean that on a case by case basis, you have to um, challenge government to show strict scrutiny? Yeah. Well, yes and no. Yes, there would have to be an individual lawsuit against each individual statute that limits ballot access, but then once that petition is filed, it's the government that must maintain the burden of proof. It's the one where the judge turns to the government lawyer and says, sir or ma'am, 
call your first witness and prove that this regulation is valid under the First Amendment. Okay, you've done there. Uh... All right, Frank and Margaret, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I, I... Frank and Margaret. Okay, um, again on, on other issues. On, on church-state separation issues as, a, as Attorney General, um, would you, how would you look at cases that are filed objecting to state supported, uh, state money being paid in vouchers to private schools, who 90% of whom are religious schools, so that state, uh, state tax money would go to support a religious school? or um, the um, lawsuits that have been filed um, against uh, people who, uh, in groups who are uh, agencies who get state money to do things that then turn around and discriminate against either their clients or, um, or, and, and their employees in terms of um, their, the religious orientation of whoever it is that's running the group. W what are your opinions on those? Uh, I, I did understand your question of whether government money should go to support a private church or a private educational body. Um, well, should it be a lot, should state money go to any private um, institution, in fact, um, when those institutions or agencies have the, have the right to discriminate against their employer, employees or have a right to, or claim the right to discriminate against their clients? Should state money, state tax money go to support those agencies or institutions? You really know how to ask a question. Um, no, I, I think because you don't want to tell me what you think. <laughs> no, it, 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 these are, you're asking a very complicated question. Uh, it's very close uh, to, the, to the Smith rule uh, as to when governments, um, can fund private and okay. Uh, you've got about four different questions in there. Uh, so I'm having difficulty answering them. Well, it's like the ERA, it's so hard you're not gonna answer it, but that's your job. Well, if our if our government were to institute a church, obviously that violates our, our the First Amendment. But what you're saying is that there was a case in Philadelphia before the Supreme Court this past year. And in that case, Philadelphia was using a church-related organization to handle adoptions, the investigations pertaining to adoptions. And there were 15 or 20 different organizations that did this. And Philadelphia goes to the church-related organization and said, will you theoretically handle a case involving same-sex marriages? And they said, no. And so the, the question, I... I you, you've posed a, a very, very similar question. Should the government of Philadelphia be allowed 
to reject an organization that's been doing a magnificent job for kids and adoptions for years upon years because they won't handle a certain type of case, which they had never been asked to handle. Now, the United States Supreme Court in that case, by a nine, I believe, nine zero vote, all agreed. It's called the Smith Rule, that the Smith Rule didn't apply. And they threw out this lawsuit, forcing Philadelphia to change its laws, to change its requirements. They had to accept the religious organization. Um, so it's a really tough area of the law. Um, and it's going to be changing fast in the United States Supreme Court in the next five or 10 years. And I think uh, religious organizations will be allowed to present services in the manner that they choose to present them. Whether you think that violates somebody's rights or not. Well, I guess the two cases that I'm aware of is agencies that are in areas where there are no other agencies to provide the services. Right. And, th and so this, and I can't remember where they are now, but they're in rural areas basically. And one denied um, a couple who were Catholic to adopt a child and the other denied doing a home study for a couple that were Jewish so that they could did, uh, so that they could adopt a child from outside the country. That was the only agency in their area that did I, I say I don't know do about those, those I don't know about those specific cases. Well they, those are in fact specific cases good. Okay. And so I wonder what you would think about that. If you were the attorney general and, and, and you would need to have an opinion on that case, would you not? I would need to know a lot more facts, just a ton more facts, because that's what is going to help. What you're going to have is an allegation of a monopoly. And I would like to hear uh, actual, the actual testimony of individuals who say that there's no other organization available. I, you know, I, you know, there's an expression. I want to. I'll be from Missouri on that. Well, the the court itself acknowledged that they were the only. What, agency what court Missouri. was that? What court was that? The, uh, you know what? I'm sorry, I don't have the specifics on the case. If you like, I can send them to you. Sure. But they they are specific cases in in rural areas in this country where people were discriminated against because of their religion. Yeah. Tough cases. Monopolies present tough cases. Yeah, and when it goes to the Supreme Court, they'll let them discriminate. Isn't that cool? All right. All right. Next. Why does right. Ellen Corley, you're going next. Okay. Yeah. I, the. I guess I kind of have you know a couple of ideas, but one was. You know, to follow up with Charlie's question and, and your clarification, you said that, you know, if you brought a free speech case to you saying that the voting, you know, process, I guess, is discriminating against me um, as a free speech, my free speech ability to uh, to represent, you know, find a representative or something, um, you would you would take the case, you would defend the case um, before, before who? Um, okay. That was right. one question. Okay, good question. Uh, because it's, it, what I would be doing is as the representative of the state of Illinois, I would be stepping in front of a judge and saying, I agree with the claimant. 
which judge a federal judge um, i don't know i don't know i don't know it's a theoretical lawsuit by an individual of the state of illinois against the state of illinois alleging that the voting procedures violate the first amendment have you thought of trying to write that up and present take it on since you agree there's a problem there um uh, i you know I, uh, may i respond mm -hmm. um i don't truly believe that the attorney general has the authority to initiate that lawsuit against his own state. Well, as a lawyer, you're not attorney general yet. Could you, as a lawyer, initiate this? Or as a citizen? Or, uh, um, well, or as a client? A ballot I, I, person yeah. who's going to have I, a hard I, time I, getting I retired on the last August, but uh, other than that, y yes, I. Uh, if I had a if, if a lawyer had a client and the client chose to file a lawsuit against the state, that would happen. Yeah. Could you represent yourself as a as a lawyer? Is she gonna I, ask? I'm just saying, can lawyers represent themselves not getting access to the ballot? I mean, right? Uh, you know, the un un you know, there's a lot of problems. Okay. How many signatures right, do you Ellen. need? Ellen, let's let's well, let him answer the question and move on. I just want to say, if I if I represented myself, I'd have a fool for a client. Okay. All right, Charlie, you're next. Yes, uh, Robin. If I decided I, I'm a pretty qualified guy. Uh, if I decided to run for governor of the state of Illinois in yeah. the upcoming uh, gubernatorial election, uh, what would I do in order to get on the ballot at, under your system? Under, Should I just notify? Do I just notify the state that I'm running for office and exercising my free speech? Yes. I just send them a letter, a memo. Yeah, I, I assume that if I were to be successful in challenging the current requirement, that I personally. I have to have 25,000 signatures on a petition, which means that a real, on a realistic level, we need 40,000 signatures throughout the state. That's gonna probably require us to spend any from 20 to $40,000 to get those signatures. But let's well, assume for a moment that all of that is held unconstitutional and goes by the wayside. I assume that the state of Illinois would institute a new statute. And that new statute would say, anybody who wants to be a candidate has to sign here on the dotted line and say that they want to be a candidate. Follow well, up. Go ahead, Charlie. If we had 25 or more candidates for every office in the state of Illinois <laughs> in a general election, yeah. I. I wouldn't this bring <coughs> the voting process to a, a result in complete chaos? Well, did it? Well, um, well what if we ever have to serious or answer. More candidates for serious. I I actually have an answer to this. I actually have an answer what? to this. Have it's you guys ever seen have you guys ever seen the Eurovision Song Contest? Uh, yes. Have you ever seen the voting that happens at the end? No. Oh, that's the best bit. But it's like about 50 candidates. It's like it's like election nights, but with 50 candidates, right? Okay. So most and I know a lot of people don't even watch the songs, they just watch the voting at the end. <laughs> let, let me say this. I the only one I've looked at that something like 200 people register to be elected president of the United States every four years. And that would be an onerous ballot. Oh, so the Democrats had 28 candidates. Did you hear anybody screaming ballot chaos? 
And the Republicans only had two candidates. And now they're only going to have one. Hey, we basically, one they only have one. The and answers, all right, all right. Justin's next. After Actually, uh, Calvin has been raising his hand. He can go ahead of me. Okay, yeah, Calvin, I, I, I have got a short one. Uh, it was a couple uh, uh, questions before. Uh, so you are very heavily uh, for... Uh, non-restriction of people being able to get their name on the ballot, right? Um, what about uh, legislation that stops people like that? Like, for example, uh, a convicted felon. Uh, how do you feel about that? Um, and do you have the same point of view when it comes to the new laws that are coming in many American states about a photo ID for, for voting? Because if you are restrict, if you're saying you're against having you get people on the ballot, to my mind, you have to say, well, restricting people from voting itself has also got to got, be right up there. Anyway, that's my question. Uh, Kelvin is your name? Yeah. Kelvin, that's a very good question. Should felons be allowed to vote? Um, what do you consider it's the government that makes the laws that make them a felon? Say it again. Would you consider it's the government hey. that makes the laws hey. that made them a felon in many cases? For example, yeah. possession of crack cocaine is a felony, but possession of powdered cocaine is a misdemeanor. Oh, good. Let's let's jump over to uh, the drug war. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, which is which is which is class based. Okay. Why is why why is one substance a misdemeanor and the other substance a felony, which restricts my my, my right to, to, to a democratic process? Is that not a form of oppression by a government, and that, that then further restricts me from voting or running for running for government to Kelvin, change the laws that, that made me a felon? Kelvin, you had me at hello. All right. I I I I want to get rid of all the drug laws. I, I want them selling those drugs at Walgreens. So long, so long as they're regulated quality. <laughs> 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 no, no, you don't, you don't, you don't really want to be smoking uh, ground glass. You really don't know, you really know. Okay. <laughs> Justin, you're next. Hey, Dan, so uh, I know you mentioned it briefly <clears throat> at the beginning. Uh, but could you elaborate more on your book and where can we get your book? Ah, uh, okay. So the name of my book is The Libertarian War on Poverty, Repairing the Ladder of Upward Mobility. Uh, I believe that it's uh, available at Amazon. I don't think there's available at anything else other than Amazon. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I, did you all follow? I don't know if you wanted me to describe the book or not, but that's how you find it. Plug your book, say it again. <laughs> yeah, I was just calling plug was just your, book. To plug your book, essentially. essentially. Wait a second, I'm gonna plug I would my, like to hear an I'm explanation of your book. <laughs> plug this book, and then we'll go to Justin and then Brian. Wait a then. second, I'm plugging my book. <laughs> Hey, can you see this? Yeah, that's, I think we can. That's uh, it's too big. You can't see it. What is the book called? Libertarian War on Poverty. <laughs> okay, is it available on Amazon? Yeah. Let me pull the website up. I'll pull the website up when we before we go to rebuttal. Are, are you saying that the libertarians are waging a war on hey, poverty? Ellen, you've already Ellen, asked you're several not, you're questions. Just, There's another clarifying. one. Ellen, Ellen, we'll get at it later. You, you're after a... Uh, it's an Justin, important you're question. Next, I'm a Justin, you're next, and Brian, and Ellen. I already asked my question, except... Here, okay, here's my follow-up, then. Uh, where can we donate to your campaign at? Ah. Uh, your website. My website. Uh, which, but which is not working yet. The, the donation system is not working yet. But I'm asking for a gigantic donation. I'm asking for five bucks. I'm asking for five bucks. Why is there an echo? 
I'm not sure. I think it may have. We got we got it solid. Ellen, you got two you got two people up. You got two things open at once. Close one of them. It's not me. 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 Well, I'm seeing two Ellens uh, in the thing. So. Okay. All right. Well, for some reason, we got rid of it here. Um, go ahead. Keep going, uh, Justin. I mean, you're, are you done, Justin? Oh, uh, Ken McMillan has a smaller uh, uh, version of the book cover. Uh, hey. There you go. Uh, so cool. Thanks. Um, and I, Dan, when, when your, when your website's up, I will definitely share it. So, and I'll make that donation. All right. Well, the website's I, it, active. It's active, but the donation button isn't working. Okay. What we'll do is at the end of the presentation, I, uh, I'll share your Amazon book site and your website. Okay. All right. Once we get done there and your it was, what was your website again? Just one more time. It, Can I? Just a minute. Give me your website one more time. Dan Robin. Okay, the number, Dan Robin for the AG. number four AG. Four AG. Dot org. Okay, I got it here. All right. Now let's get back to our to our questioners. And Justin, since you're done, we'll go to Brian Doheny or Brian Doheny. And yeah. Go ahead, Brian. So a couple uh, it, it's a, a, a kind of three three issues of the same there are three parts of the same issue right uh the foid card you know what are your thoughts about the foid card um what are your thoughts about um the illinois pensions being constitutionally you know protected um and um with that you know kind of related to margaret's question of you know, public money going to religious institutions. Is that related to vouchers? Like, you know, as I think of the libertarian solution to this education problem, it's like, give, give the vouchers to the parents, let them decide, right? If they spend it, a, if that's a, is that an issue with the, the vouchers? And that's it. Those are my three questions. Uh, I don't see... Void cards as ever being overruled by the courts seems to be, uh, you know, I know the Second Amendment rights. I assume you're talking about guns. Yes. yes? Okay. Oh, yes, definitely, for sure. All right. Um, so, I, I, of course, the Second Amendment is always the uh, distant second cousin to to the other amendments. And so it will never, ever come out as a true, uh, you know, U.S. constitutional right. They're going to have a right to regulate uh, guns to the extent that they require you to register. But anybody should be able to be able to register, uh, you know, submit their name and give them their address and say, okay, now I can have a gun. Number two, pension, Illinois. I actually uh, would refer you to my website. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, what's that? What's that web address? <laughs> yeah, what's the web address. <laughs> um, so here's what I wrote, uh, and it's up there at the, on the website. The Republicans have in many years past presented a theory uh, to get elected called star of the beast. That is, you know, if we cut taxes, there won't be enough money left over for us to be spending a whole lot of money. Well, it never kind of worked because they never cut spending. So I was reviewing the Illinois pension problem. And I think I was looking at the, uh, what is it, the IPI organization and their materials. And I think 
that the current pension system, now you're going to have to understand that I'm being terribly cynical here, is the equivalent of starving the beast. Because all of our money is going to the pensions. <laughs> they literally had to cut the spending in all the other areas of government. So the Democrats and the unions have figured out how to starve the beast. Thank you, unions. Uh, your last question was public vouchers. Uh, how uh, bizarre do you want me to get? I, I suppose I could get fairly bizarre on this subject. Um, I had a great conversation over a Christmas party uh, as to whether or not public money should ever be spent for people, the, a college student. Should the government spend its money on college students? And this young man, who turned out to be a Republican, uh, said quite clearly that that's just crony capitalism for the rich kids. And I thought about that. I tended to agree with it. Uh, that spending money to educate rich kids to be lawyers, doctors, engineers, etc., is abusive. It's crony capitalism. But then it made me consider the question. What about high school? To what extent does the public benefit from spending its money on high schools? How do you and I benefit? I know the students benefit. If we educate somebody who then goes on to college and becomes a professor, he's gonna make a lot of money. If, if we educate somebody uh, and they end up going to college and law school, they're gonna make a lot of money. How does that benefit me? How does that benefit you? I don't think it does. I, I just don't think that government spending money on education beyond, beyond the three R's. I, I would agree that we want an educated citizenry who can understand language and then vote. But beyond that, I think spending money on education is crony capitalism. Most of us don't benefit from, let me switch how I'm answering the question. Am I allowed to switch? I don't know. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> when I was practicing law, I was part of a, an organization uh, that helped, e we helped each other get leads, uh, get business for each other. This, these meetings had 100 to 125 people at it. And we all had breakfast together once a month. And so I would go about the process of asking the people sitting next to me, what was your major in college? Are you using anything of that to support yourself? And other than the doctors and lawyers, even the lawyers, as a lawyer, I can tell you that the knowledge I use to practice law, I learned after law school.
And so and would you, do you feel the same way? I mean, as it comes to funding education, I, what I think of is the difference between, like you say, you know, up here, we got Lake County, very wealthy. Property taxes fund the education system. For the most part, those kids get a very good education as compared to some kids from like Harvey, right? You know, some, some kid from Harvey, he's not going to have the same resources and the same access. And so you're going to have, you know, it is publicly funded, right? But it's the be, government educating kids in the first place. But it would be local, right? So if the state or the federal government doesn't come in and equalize education, you are going to wind up with these classes of people. Uh, I wrote on this exact subject at my website. So you can go read that under education. Really? So. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll, I'll check it out. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, my point, my point being, and you asked, you know, the libertarian war on poverty question. To what extent is the government interfering with or assisting in poor people getting educated. Now, somebody would have to go long and hard for me to believe that the public schools in the city of Chicago are doing a whole lot for the poor people. They're well, I, I would take exception to that because I would say that, it, you know, the, the schools provide care, right? The parents are able to go to work, even if all it does is warehouse them and feed them. It is providing a public benefit. And, you know, is it, you know, adequate or sufficient? I mean, that's a different question, but they're right. getting something. And right. that the, the resource, the access provides other benefits to the parents who are able to go out and work. Brian, Brian let me... Uh, you asked a question before, and I want to try and get back to it, and then I'll answer that last question. Huh. So the question is whether the, the student in Harvey can get a decent education, one where he can move ahead uh in life or whether he's going to be stuck and i think most of the conversations we have in this regard insult the students and insult the parents of those students that they are so Friggin incompetent and incapable of helping themselves. I just think it's so terribly insulting to them. You think kids who are growing up and they know they're poor don't want to absolutely, if it's up to them to get themselves out of poverty, and no, ain't nobody going to do it for them other than maybe their parents. That they and their parents will figure it out. Now, so that's answer number one. Answer number two. You said, look, education, public education provides daycare. It provides a way to get the kids uh, out of the house so that the parents can go to work. And that's true you can't deny that but if our government was taxing us less and or not taxing us at all for other than maybe grade school would the rents be in half would the tax on all the real estate be in half? Would those parents then have the resources to hire their own school, to hire their own daycare provider, 
I, it's a question, not an answer. Uh, but I, but I think you have to answer right. that question before you can, you, you get an answer to your question. All right. Is, well, we I mean, to... so I, you know, I've been a person. Okay, Brian, who, we got to move on. You know, like Brian, we got to school move on. provided the Brian. meal. That's important. Okay, we got to move on. Now, Adam and Charles have both had questions before, but I haven't had one yet. Um, I want to know, Don. You know, we just recently went through a COVID nineteen pandemic. I'd like to know where you would stay. It, would you consider? the public health to be more paramount to your personal freedom or how would you do the vaccination thing in lieu of the lawsuits coming to the state of Illinois? Uh, multiple questions there. Um, I am triple vaccinated. If they offer me five more, I'll take five more. Okay. Uh, I truly believe that we should have told America to go talk to their own personal doctors. Okay. As to whether they or should or should not be vaccinated. I think we would have ended up with a larger percentage of the people being vaccinated that way than the systems that we instituted so far. Okay. I have no way of proving that. It, it's, uh, how, you, you, it's impossible. I'm, I'm, I, I'm a blithering idiot on the subject. I can't know because we, we won't be able to go backwards in time. Uh, I think you had some other questions. No, basically, I was just wondering, though, would you consider public health more important than personal freedom in some instances? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, in some instances, sure, public health is more important. But <laughs> But in, do you remember during my speech, I said, rights are rights. I don't think one right is better than another right. So truly, when it comes to my personal opinion, yeah. I think strict scrutiny applies to every single regulation that the government restricts our rights. So to answer your question, okay. should private rights be more important than public health should be subjected to strict scrutiny? Uh, can the government prove by competent evidence that its policies are the least restrictive of a compelling state interest? Okay. Now, in certain cases, if, if what what was that old disease, Ebola? Yeah. Good God. If Ebola had been as contagious as this, well, hell yeah, uh, public, <laughs> public health uh, would have been more important than individual rights because they could have proved it. Okay. Fair, fair question, fair answer. Okay, Charlie, you're next. Yeah, Robin, uh, you want to link to, that you, you don't want to finance education. So, and you, enunciated the basis of this view is uh, I've heard this from other libertarian sources that unless it benefits me personally yeah. the government shouldn't do it right so I don't own a car so I guess the state of Illinois should get out of the road business 
and stop clearing snow <laughs> and so forth. Or if there's flood control along the Mississippi, it's not likely to affect me. So it's not an appropriate activity of government because it doesn't benefit me. This is a, am I correct? This is a libertarian view. Unless no, you're, not right. you're not right. Affects everyone. You're, you're not right. In the state of Illinois, it's not authorized. Charlie, every single Charlie, person. hold on. You're doing well, but l let me answer. Um, there are public goods in this world. You you can't. I, do I benefit from the military? You're damn straight I do. Do I benefit from a police department? You're damn straight I do. Do I benefit from the government educating kids so they can be, so they can read, write, and do arithmetic and then be a, an educated voter? I benefit from an educated community. But that's just reading, writing, and arithmetic. Okay, um, let's move on to Adam Bowling, and then we'll go back to Kelvin. Uh, thank you again, Dan. Roads. I don't need a road. Well, Charlie. Okay. You grow may your own food. May I answer? Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Make all your own food in Bridgeport, pal. <laughs> well, um, I'll wait. Yeah, it's roads in roads. I just read, I was starting a, about a 500 page book on privatization of roads. Um, I don't think that the privatization of roads was possible 10 years ago because there would be no way to pay for them. But under modern technology, where we go through polling booths at 70 miles an hour, it is technologically now possible to charge people for the use of every road and to privatize all of them. Now, that That's ain't gonna happen. It's not going to happen in your lifetime or my lifetime. So I don't know why we're talking about it. You're right. This is an improvement. This is what? That's Hell yeah. an improvement. Oh, yeah. On a government contract. Private streets. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's move on. Oh, cool. <laughs> okay. We got Adam. We got Joseph Curian and then R.R. Tiki for questioners. And I think after R.R. Tiki, we're going to go to rebuttals. Adam, you're next. You also mentioned, I think you said Kelvin earlier, right? Yeah, I think you did. Yeah, K Kelvin was in the queue, I believe, right after me. Hello, Kelvin. Oh, yeah, Kelvin, go ahead. Okay, so um, you say you cannot see any point in education past uh, the three hours. Um, how about when we, when we started pre recording this session? We talked about the Beatles, we talked about. Um, music we but we are, but we can expand that we can expand that to plays films television um the every piece of art you've seen produced more or less in the that you know we say from the 1920s on for the last hundred years has probably been a, been a product of somebody getting a free education past the level where where, where they could write that name you know there's an appreciation of american history that goes with that right to vote and that that, uh, that educated rights. There's you know there's also you know you, you talk about this that uh, so uh, and do you not feel that your system where re higher education passed any any form of grammar school or any form of uh, a post teen uh, education, which is what it amounted, would just like to basically were a, a regression, and uh, America would become a third world. Um, country with uh, with with with, ch with chanty towns. 
because you'd have, uh, what, what, what else would you do at, at 30 with your, oh, you will, you'd work for the man, okay, but, uh, so basically only an, only an elite would be, uh, would, uh, would, would have an education. That police force that protects you at this moment in time would only have the basics in, uh, in forms of education. The man who comes to, to rewire your, your, uh, your sockets, right? The electrician. So, yes. Tell us. Uh, hey, hey, tell us. Uh, I'm not going to answer all those questions, but can, may I try? Go on. Thank you. Um, you're telling me the Beatles wrote wonderful music because of public education? Yeah, the, um, uh, Paul was in the uh, Liverpool Institute and John was at our school. Yeah. And, and that's how they met. So, and that's no, how they no, met. Was that, Kel, 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 was that, was that education then a bit then about so, to go to work? May I? May I? Go on. Thank you. Um, I don't think they taught those Beatles a single note. I don't think, you know, in the, in the modern world, you're telling me that a public school teacher is gonna is gonna is capable of training people to write code for computers? No, but they can inspire them. John Lennon had an art teacher that inspired him to, 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 I, to, to do stuff. Okay. That's what a, that's what a good educa education okay. does. It inspires in you. It may not be any subject that you that you that you're teaching, you, but it inspires you nevertheless. You and I agree that inspiration is absolutely essential i just happen to think that inspiration comes from yourself your friends your family and true enough from educators but if i'm going to be a great musician and i know it because that's what I feel in my bones, that I want to be a great musician. Would I want to pick as my education a public school or a school that concentrates on music? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. Okay. If you look at, if you no, no, just, I, I'll just quickly bold. If you look at art in the nineteen up to the nineteenth century, and then last from the twentieth century, and when we've had public education, you had an you know, get, the only people that produced art in the nineteenth century were people who had money, right? After the uh, public education, you got people like the Beatles, like the Who, like Pink Floyd. Well, maybe not Pink Floyd, but uh, but uh, like. The doors, whatever people who went to high school education, uh, writing songs. But you do not, you wouldn't, have, you wouldn't have Bob Dylan without a public education system. Well, Kelvin, <laughs> you can also, you could also argue that the benefits of capitalism were able to acquire the tools for better yes. use and cheaper. Yeah, I'm nothing education. against nothing against capitalism, uh, as it, so long as it's regulated. Yeah, right. Okay, let's move on, Adam, and then, uh. And then uh, we'll go with our last question of Joseph. Okay, and then okay, we're going thank to thank you again. We're going to rebuttals after I, Joseph. I've uh, I've had the pleasure of meeting Dan once or twice before. Um, I've got the Libertarian Party of Illinois T-shirt. I know most of your discussion Tim, tonight was about free speech and voting. Uh, Ellen, you've already gone. Our our Kiki hasn't had it. It's getting to be close to eight thirty. Uh, so let's I, I'll try to keep this short. Uh, we you spoke a little bit about no victim, no crime. So uh, but I know we've had some chat in the um, in the text, you know, chat uh, and a little discussion around the edges about political corruption. Uh, I, I know that uh, we haven't talked about that much in regards to your candidacy, but what would you see as the role for the attorney you as attorney if elected attorney general for investigating? Uh, extensive political corruption in Chicago or in the state of Illinois. 
Uh, do you think that would be largely your ju jurisdiction? Do you think that would be largely federal prosecutors? Um, is it racketeering run wild? Give us your thoughts, please. Thank you. Uh, as I was growing up, uh, I didn't know much about libertarianism. Uh, the only thing I knew were the Dems and the Republicans. But I always knew one thing. I wanted one party to be the executive and the other party to be the prosecutor. <laughs> um, as uh, I think there is a serious role for the attorney general's office to go after corruption. Uh, however, one of the reasons why it's generally a job of the federales to go after corruption is because they will file those criminal lawsuits in federal court. You know, our judges have to get elected or appointed in the po political process. And I, I have met a, met a lot of judges and, and they are, almost all of them are as honest as day is long. But as political animals, they know, know which side their bread is buttered on. And I would be afraid that they would not prosecute as ve vehemently as a federal court might. Uh, so what do I see my role in the investigation and prosecution of corruption? Sure, it has to be there, but probably not as much as you think. And a quick follow-up, if I may, is there any danger of the politicization of investigations and prosecutions? Thank you. Is there any danger of political politicization of the investigation itself? Uh, it becoming a political tool to just investigate the other party for fun rather than on the merits of the case yeah. or preferential. Yeah. Um, to get you know, and Adams, thank you. These are these are wonderful questions for which I'm no more equipped than you are to okay. answer. Uh, I think that uh, you know I hated Trump as much as the next guy, huh. but uh, we uh, we are in danger of turning ourselves into a third world country by using the criminal system to go after politicians uh, and i we've got to be very careful about how many criminal laws we have in this country it's it's very scary anyway uh, that's about as much as i know all right joseph you're next thank you uh, Dan, thank you for the presentation and good luck on your candidacy. Thank you. uh, following up on my question earlier on signature requirements uh, from your answer, I don't get the impression that a legal remedy across the board will be forthcoming. Now, Going in the opposite direction, reiterating uh, Charlie's question in a way, as a practical matter, without such restrictions, how can you run this uh, rather large system of democracy? Joseph, could you try me again on that? Yeah, um, as a practical matter, without such restrictions, how can you run rather a large system of democracy with uh, 
uh, over 200 million people in the process. <sighs> Joseph, I don't think I have the world's greatest answer for you. I'm just, my, Bill Redpath, who's running for Illinois Senate, says that our current system is an affront to justice, and democracy. Remember what he said during my speech. If you wanted to form a party, a brand new party, and run and, and submit a candidate for every statewide office, you couldn't do it. You'd need a million signatures. A million. Doesn't that shock us? Isn't that outrageous? Is that the democracy we're living in? Is it? I feel like we're we're you know I know that we're not like Saddam Hussein. The laws for Saddam was that no one could run against him, and you you were forced to go to the polling booth. I know we're not that. But it sure feels like it, that outside parties are being kept out. Is that the democracy you want to live on? I don't. Question. Uh, just so, it does, don't see many signatures. Are they going to be actual signatures or could you do online? I'm sorry? Can you do online uh, petitions to get uh, yeah, a yeah. Not under current law because each each individual page has to be signed by the uh, person who has to swear that he was in person to gather that signature. So well, uh, the, the UK system, we, we, the petitions can be uh, submitted online. So long as you put your name and address and you are who you are, you know, you, you put your, you put a verified, verified name and address, you, you know, on, on, on your, on your uh, signature and petition. Hey, hi, hi, this is, a, I think we need to go to rebuttals. To, yeah, I know, but uh, these yeah, guys won't stop it, asking questions. We got, well, well, you need to, you need to moderate. Iron foot. Well, we're moderating enough because I'm going to try. We've got one person who hasn't gone yet. And that's our Tiki. She's had her hand up a couple of times. Did you still have a question there, please? Yeah. Hi. Uh, so <clears throat> um, uh, I was wondering what your position is on every individual American having the right to boycott or to invest in whatever corporation or company or uh, uh, system they want to invest in rather than being told by politicians in the pay of foreign countries um, uh, what we should do and what we should not do as Americans. Your, so your question is, should Americans be have the right to finance and, and run whatever company they want without no, having no, to no, ask? No. Without no. having to ask permission of the no. government. No, no, no. Uh, not, not having to finance and run, but to invest in or to boycott other uh, uh, anybody or any company or any country that we do not feel individually uh, happy with. Yes. Well, I think your question answers itself. Say that again? I think your question answers itself. Of no, it doesn't answer it, sir, because uh, Illinois just uh, has passed a, a, a law prohibiting uh, American citizens from investing or boycotting whoever they wish to invest or boycott in. Uh, I I don't know the details of that prohibition, but so it what, sounds... what would your what would your position be? 
in a situation like that? Where do you stand? Well, uh, like most other libertarians, I'm in favor of individual liberty to boycott or invest in <coughs> whatever they want to uh, boycott or invest in. Okay. With that, I am closing out the questions tonight. We're going straight to rebuttals. That's now, like you guys, yeah, all right, yeah. I'd like to go with a three minute time frame, but let's see who has rebuttals first. All right, Frank and Mark. Yeah. Okay, uh, who's got rebuttals now tonight? Uh, let that, me know. That's, that's an applause for the speaker. Okay, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. All right, so Adam Balling, Justin Tucker, who else? Oh, I'm a Kelvin, Charlie. I know you're gonna go. Charlie, I know you're gonna go. I'll Anybody go last. else? Huh? I'll I know you go last, Charlie. Anybody else? Ellen's got to do a rebuttal. Yeah. Okay, Ellen, you want to do a rebuttal? I'll think about it. <laughs> okay, we got we got Frank and Margaret. Okay. Doesn't matter. Tim? Yeah? Should I mute myself? That, that's up to you, Dan. Um, you'll get the last word in, okay? Okay. I got to figure you, out how to local, do this. No, that's local right. candidates, don't be shy. <laughs> and just don't don't worry about it. Just, just you can unmute yourself at the bottom there without much trouble. All right. So we have Frank and Margaret, Adam Bowling, Justin Tucker, Kelvin. Bob Matter and Charlie. Am I missing anybody? Okay, so Frank and Margaret, Adam Balling, Justin Tucker, Kelvin, Bob Matter, and Charlie. Um, if you guys aren't going to object to going past nine o'clock, I'd like to try to do about a four minute rebuttal. And, and me. And who? Brian Denny. Oh, I'm sorry, Brian. Okay. All right, bear with me a minute. Okay, so we got. Keep it down to three, Timmy. Huh? I think we should keep it at three. Um, we'll go on too long. All right, I'll keep it at three minutes then. You guys to figure you can make your points in three minutes? Okay, let's go to three. Let's do a three minute clock then. Uh, and uh, Dan, you get a chance. All right, uh, Frank and Margaret, go ahead, three minutes. Okay, um, I find your educational policy appalling. You don't want to teach kids history or civics or anything else. You don't want to subsidize any of that. I also think the things with the vouchers are also appalling because they take money out of the public school system, which teaches 90% of the students that we have to begin with and puts it into schools that discriminate against stu uh, students, and employees, it, because 90% of the schools are uh, of private schools are religious, and many of those schools actively discriminate against employees as well as, as students who they take in. Um, uh, the uh, charter school system is notorious for not taking in disabled students, English language learners. Um, quote, behavioral problems, all of those need to be dealt with with the public school system. And then when we have uh, public schools based on property taxes, then we have uh, in poor areas, we have poor schools, which is inherently unequal and discriminatory. So, and then one of the reasons somebody said about the North side students were doing well, and it's also because the, the uh, parents are educated enough. Our, the parents themselves are not working two jobs each and trying to keep their nose above the waterline and they have time to put into school efforts and to raise money for the schools. I've been involved in public schools on the, on the uh, on, uh, fundraising committees and on the local school council 
and I have very long-term and, and uh, intimate knowledge of all of this stuff. So the other thing in terms of the voucher system, it's really appalling. I mean, it, 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 what Brown v. Board of, v. Board of Education was because the, the, when they said that the, that the public schools had to admit students who were black, the people pulled their white students out of the system and started these segregation schools and then demanded that they, they got tax support for these schools. And that, so that the parents of the black students then filed uh, in the court. And that was the basis of the Brown v. Education thing. But what's, what's happening now is that they're using a religious reason to segregate schools. They're using a religious reason to discriminate. And uh, the, the courts are much less anxious to, uh, to work with that, to say that that's really can't, should not be done. And this current court is very possibly gonna break down some of the significant um, safety protections of church state education uh, to, um, uh, well, anyway, this is, a, I'm, I'm really appalled at, at some of the things that are going on on the, and the Supreme Court level about all of this. So I think that my real problem with, with libertarians is that they're really very- Three minutes are up. Three minutes. They're very short-sighted and stupid. And I'm sorry. You really <laughs> pushed my buttons, Justin, and I apologize, <laughs> but you're really being very short-sighted. I went into college with, with all grants and things because I was from a working class family and I wouldn't have been able to go to college to be a nurse. Now, if you want to cut your health care because there are your three minutes are up, right, move on to the next rebuttal. Educated by by getting money from the government than doctors and lawyers. So okay. go cover by yourself. All right, Margaret. Thanks for your comments. Okay. No, I just not No, that that's all right. I, I know. Margaret, you did a nice job tonight with the speaking. All right, Adam, you go next. All right, I will uh, try to keep it going. Um, I appreciate some of Margaret's criticisms, but I would also remind her that I believe with the GI Bill, even before the Brown decision, we already saw the use of taxpayer to private colleges and religious colleges. And there was, I do not recall which year, which upheld the controversial notion that yeah you could use the gi bill even at a seminary i believe was how that uh, case was decided um i can't say that i'm you know necessarily thrilled about the merger of church and state but we also know that in these discussions of libertarianism versus social democracy almost every other social democracy has state supported and subsidized churches that have been reduced to kind of you know, bureaucratic organizations. And when you file a tax return in Germany, you pick which church your tax dollars are going to. Uh, and you'll, you'll have to explicitly state it. Um, so people I know with German citizenship have described some of this to me firsthand. Um, and we have also seen, as I've said a, a few times here over the years, Germany is a prime example of this, where the university graduating classes are over three fourths the children of people who already went to university is okay. cheap for the less than one quarter of students who are not from that background who go to university. Uh, but it is not like all of a sudden people, all it's exclusively working class kids or disproportionately working class kids. It's still disproportionately upper middle class kids that go to colleges, even in places where it's uh, picked up by the taxpayer more or less entirely. Uh, Dan, thank you for your remarks. Uh, especially the nuances of the politicization of corruption investigations, uh, even though the voter restrictions were, of course, your main topic. Uh, I think there's a lot of ways to uh, work on those issues. Tim, did I go over three? No, you're, you're about... I look like I'm about two minutes. Yes, you've got about a minute left. So... Uh, I'll, I'll try and keep it polite. There's a few other candidates who were a little more bashful tonight, uh, but who had joined this meeting. I'll just give a shout out to them locally. Uh, Andrew Kapinski is running 
to succeed uh, industry. Uh, he's been in office for eight years up in the northwest side of the northwest suburbs. Um, and Nico Tsatsoulis has run for parliament in Greece and is running for assessor of Cook County now. Um, and he knows about a parliamentary system in a country with only about four or five million or so people in it, where you have, you know, more than five or 10 candidates for office. Oh, shocking. And yet somehow they can still count the votes. Um, anyhow, I hope everyone's doing well despite our disagreements tonight and that all of the food that is transported to Charlie on foot or by bicycle reaches him safely without having to go over the roads. Okay. Maybe some of it could drop in by helicopter. Have a All good right. one. Enough, enough said. Thank you. Brian, you're next. Brian DeHenny, you're next. So I, uh, as a libertarian, I want to say that I too am appalled by your school policies. The, you know, I have personally benefited from food stamps, from the GI Bill, from welfare, from uh, grants, and they helped me a lot. <clears throat> and so and people don't pick their parents, and sometimes people's parents aren't <clears throat> capable. They're not, uh, they lack the means to support them, their kids themselves. And it's not an insult, right? It's, it's a reality. And whatever that situation is without passing any judgment, on the, the parents, those children need to be provided for their education and their health, food, school provides a lot, a, a lot to children. And I am not in favor of the libertarian position on this, this anarchist hand, hands off approach to education. That's all I have to say. Okay, thanks, Brian. All right, uh, Justin, you're next. Justin Tucker, you're next. All right. Um, thanks, guys. Um, I had a really good time tonight, as I always do here at the college. And thanks, Dan, uh, Dan for coming on. Straw men everywhere, as yeah. per usual here at the college. Um, again, I support Dan. Uh, please sign his petition. Here we start collecting here less than two weeks um donate to his campaign buy his book i'll have to buy his book and donate uh but you can do that as well also uh if you're a libertarian or you like what uh what what we say visit lpillinois.org click on the donate button if you want to help us with our ballot access campaign kent go right now visit lpillinois.org click on the donate button uh <laughs> Um, yes, and if, if Nico wants to do a rebuttal, I think he should do one because he looks like he turned on his camera, so maybe he will. Um, I, I believe in separation of church and state, but I it, sometimes, you know, if you take it too, I, you know, I think it sometimes goes a little too far. For example, there's a St. Mary Street just right over here. Like what, uh, is the ACLU gonna have to like sue it, the city of Illinois to change the name of that? I think that kind of goes a little too far. You know, are we gonna have to change the town, you know, uh, to the, the city of St. Paul, Minnesota? We're gonna have to change the name of San Francisco. Uh, um, you know, monopolies are bad, but for whatever reason, Margaret seems to think school are good especially if they're government monopolies. Um, well, I'm going to say... And, just, and that they're good and that they I'll do a... Uh, that they do a good job of educating the kids. Uh, I have no problem with, with people getting their tax dollars back, families, and then wanting to spend that on, on, on a private education, even if it's a religious one. Um... Uh, you know, I think that the only if it were to violate the First Amendment to only say certain religious schools are exempt, I think it would probably seem to be where I would uh, think that um, would be a, a violation of the First Amendment. Um, Milton Friedman uh, has, you know, his voucher plan is doesn't proclude, doesn't 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 abolish 
public schools, that's always an option. Uh, so Milton Freeman even doesn't uh, support abolishing public schools. And government is the biggest discriminator. Uh, if, if, if Margaret is, thinks that discrimination is bad, why do I gotta wait till I'm in my 60s to get my social security money back? Or why do, why, why do you support government taxing people at different rates? just based on how much of their income is. That seems very discriminatory. Oh, okay, but Justin, I, I don't think he has a problem you, with that. Your Thank three you. minutes are up, Justin. I'm sorry? Your three, your three minutes are up. Uh, three minutes are rich. Three all right, minutes. so now we're going to go to uh, Kelvin. You got three minutes. All right, I just got to go quick one. Justin, to, from a Kelvin to a Justin, I've got to be in favor of scientists getting more, more names than saints. <laughs> um, okay, uh, right. I have my stream in a bit of The maybe the problems that you got have getting 25,000 signatures on a petition is perhaps that nobody really wants a system where education only goes up to uh, the three R's. We live in a, t a toll road system. Basically, everywhere is uh, pay as you go. And, you know, nobody, but of course, the social elite, uh, which um, unfortunately in America is very racial, um, tends, tends, are the only people who can afford an education uh, to drive on the roads, a healthcare, any, anything, whatever. Uh, I don't think that the, the libertarian ideal you set forward actually afford you but actually your original premise that, that the biggest problem with uh, social mobility is, is regulation no i'm sorry somebody living in malawi on 40 dollars a month right they're not looking around and saying oh my goodness i could actually get out of this poverty if there was less regulation no the problem is that the, the, the everywhere you, you've got you've got a, an unregulated uh, or a, a biased education system you, that is biased in favor of the, of the house. And if you happen to be black or Hispanic, yes, it's racial as well. It, you are, if, it, it's like saying, yes, if you're gonna do this, you're gonna do this. But this is like saying, okay, we're gonna play poker and it's all fair, but I get six cards and you already get five. All right, yeah, sure. A full house still beats a flush. You can still bluff me, but I get six cards and you get five. The, the biggest point, 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 when you talked to, about earlier about the um, I will not play politics with other people's lives speech, one of the points of that was the fact that he could take, he could take as a working class man, take his education as far as he wanted to. And that's, that gave us, that gave the leader of that Labour Party, that gave Biden that speech to plagiarise, that education. And you would negate that for some, for, oh, well, I'm all right, Jack. Well, Okay, let's assume that you weren't all right, Jack. Let's assume that you weren't born white. Or straight of length, even. Yeah? Where's your equality of opportunity? And not only that, that leads to a poorer society because it leads to less of a meritocracy. And a meritocracy is the only thing that, that, that puts us above the third world. It's our educated, Okay, uh, Kevin, workforce. three minutes are up. Go on. Okay, so next thing. Bob, you're up. Bob Matter, you're up. <clears throat> okay, yeah, thanks, Dan. I appreciate you uh, coming on tonight. Um, well, I, I still call myself a, uh, a libertarian. Actually, I call myself a, a geo-libertarian because I'm more or less a believer in Henry George's uh, idea of a single tax. So pretty much, uh, uh, yeah, I would say, at least formerly libertarian, but who believes that taxes should really just uh, come out of a land tax and not uh, taxes on, uh, on income or on sales taxes, which uh, punishes production. And, and labor, we we don't we should want to uh, increase production and encourage people to work, and not to, and not provide a disincentive. Uh, and uh, 
However, I've I've been following myself. Uh, I've been finding myself breaking further and further apart from the Libertarian Party, in uh, in a couple of respects. And one of them is like uh, this this business about drugs. Um, constantly, I'm hearing Libertarians whining and whining and whining about you know there should be no drug laws. There should be no drug laws. Oh, we practically have no drug laws. There's no drug laws are barely enforced. Um, and if you go uh, go on YouTube and look at some of the video taken in uh, Philadelphia, just driving down the streets and seeing all the uh, fentanyl addicts humped over and just, you know, and living on the sidewalks. And in L.A., same thing. In San Francisco, uh, same thing. Is this what we want our, our uh, society to, to look like because of our, you know, that's just soft on drugs, let alone having them legal. So now I'm thinking maybe legal drugs are, I think maybe we want some guardrails here and uh, drugs is one thing that I think I want to see guardrails on. And I was just thinking about, you know, a couple of friends of mine that I like to spend time with uh, who are uh, sober, uh, you know, as far as like staying away from drugs. Um, and it's so uh, enjoyable to spend time with people who see the world through, sober eyes and, and not through drug addled uh, uh you know eyes um the other thing is uh how this how the uh, this whole gay business went totally off the rails and years ago i thought well i had the libertarian ab- attitude that uh you know if it doesn't bother me you know i really don't care what people do as long as it doesn't bother me and then we had uh and then we had gay marriage come in and i kind of you know said, well, yeah, you know, they, why should, you know, why shouldn't they be miserable like everybody else? So, yeah, let them get married too. And, uh, but now it's turned into all this uh, transgender stuff. And now, you know, women in, in, uh, in, uh, I mean, men in women's sports and, uh, you know, now it's, it's gone totally off the rails. So again, I think we need some guideposts there and, um, and some limitations and I fully support governor DeSantis and his, his bill, his uh, parental rights and education three bill. Three minutes are up. All right, Bob, your three minutes okay. are up. All right, Charlie, you've got uh, Nico. Did you want to go real Wait, quick? I, or I, not? I'll, I'll talk. I'll say something. All right, because. Uh, um, um, okay, all right. Hi. Um, three yeah, minutes. I, I'd like to say that I think one of the biggest problems in our society um is is actually the democrats and the fact that they put massive pressure on big tech to censor the hell out of the internet um and and um as a result anybody who challenges the establishment narrative um um gets taken down from social media um there is um uh, this establishment media is is basically a propaganda organ most of it uh, of the democratic party um i you know no nobody is um you know um i think that since the ukraine war started i think that facebook has changed its policy like six times um they didn't allow um news reporting about hunter biden's laptop because they said it was Russian disinformation, and now they're walking that back. I mean, they, I mean, this is this is um, this is censorship by proxy. That's what's going on in our country, and I think it's it's a massive disservice. I, I mean, I, I think it's going to destroy our country. Um, you you can't challenge um, the narrative whether you you disagree that vaccines that people shouldn't be forced to inject things against their body against their will as a vaccine mandate and if you don't do that you know well fuck you're excluded from from everything going on you know you're not allowed into any venues and yet i see i, I if i had like a dollar for every single boosted person who got COVID, I mean, it, I, I would be a rich person. Um, 
I'm exaggerating slightly there. Um, so, I mean, this, this whole narrative that, you know, you have to do it one way and dissenting voices, I mean, that's the great thing about the college. You can speak your mind, but, you know, in, in a lot of uh, venues, you, you can't. And, um, you know, that that's why, you know, we, you know, our foreign policy is so bad. That's one of the reasons is because, you're, you know, there's very little dissent allowed. Um, it's also why we, you know, nobody cares. Uh, it contributes to nobody caring about what's going on in Yemen. Things are just probably just as bad. I believe they're just as bad in Yemen as they are in Ukraine. And yet we don't give a damn about what's going on in Yemen. Um, yeah, I mean, it, there's just one propaganda, um, you know, it's mostly just one propaganda um, outlet. And, and that makes me, this censorship through proxy makes me not want to vote for the Democrats. Um, and I have some issues with the Republicans. So, you know. Your three minutes are up. Party. Okay, thanks. That's it. All right, Charlie, go ahead. First of all, I want to thank our speaker, uh, Daniel. Thank you very much for your presentation and for your exercise of good citizenship and seeking uh, to serve in the office in the state of Illinois. I'll be eclectic as usual. Ellen, there's a thousand channels on cable. If you don't like one, I suggest you turn the dial and listen to another one. Uh, there's plenty. If you don't like social media, then don't listen to it. Okay, the other thing is, um, regarding the signature thing, in the real world, I collected signatures for virtually every election since who knows when. I'm a mace and I'm a weekly, 10 weekly meetings regarding signature collection. It's amazing how many of these candidates we have running for office who very often don't even collect one signature for their own campaigns. Believe you me, it happens all the time. Complete indolency. There's one right now. We got 2,000 signatures. The candidate got eight. Eight signatures. That's some real deadbeats out there. No bellyache to me. They did nothing to get on the ballot. The other thing is there are two election laws. Laws in the state of Illinois regarding elections. A major one was passed under Rauner. We had a program on the college. It, and there most recently, uh, the Pritzker passed another law. The idea was to ensure there'd be no voter suppression and to see that everybody uh, had an opportunity to exercise their free speech. Uh, that's what's important, that everybody gets the vote and that there's no actions taken to preclude that from happening. Uh, there's 108 board of elections that cover the state of Illinois, none of which have any relevance to the office of the attorney general, except if one of those 108 board of commissions who are appointed largely uh, commits fraud or, or voter suppression. That's the only function of the attorney general that I can perceive regarding voting um, like this. Um, and last of all, uh, if you are unqualified, if you like present kidding. yourself to be a candidate for a political party uh, and you demonstrate that you're perhaps not qualified, that party has the right to decline you using their name or their resources in order to occupy offices. If you're not selected, thank you very much for applying. Think about what maybe you did wrong or right and come back next time. Okay, thank you, Duncan. And again, good luck to the, uh, the Libertarian Party there. Looks like they're doing some good things out there. Okay, Dan, you get the last word and uh, unmute. And then after you're done, we'll adjourn the college. Oh, all right. As much time as you need. Oh, really? I yes. get three and a half minutes? Well, you know, we're asking that you don't go 20. Yeah, well, I, hopefully. We've, I, had, we've had hope, people do that before, though. Hopefully I'll try and go fast. Margaret, thank you for your comments. Uh, history and civics is helping the kids in the inner city 
not. Um, uh, Spike Lee. The uh, taking money for private, uh, to giving money to the parents to go to private schools has not taken money away from uh, public schools. Um, most of the private schools are attracting your uh, black families uh, and uh, th those families who have children with behavior problems. That's where the kids are going. Um, Adam, um, the GI Bill. Uh, Adam, I don't know if he's still on. I'm going to uh, recommend. I'm, here. I'm going to recommend. Uh, is this backwards? On my screen, it's backwards. Uh, no, it's right way. Oh, okay. The case against education by Brian Kaplan. Uh, read that book, and then come back and tell me what benefit the world is getting out of educating these people, uh, uh, or what they could do on their own. Uh, so, and then I think it was also, uh, Justin and maybe Brian, uh, Adam too. Uh, and, and it's a tough subject. I, I'm not saying it's an easy one. Uh, what can the poor do? What are they capable of doing? Uh, everybody seems to be able to answer that question for them. I'm going to recommend a book called The Alternative. The author's name is Mauricio L. Miller. Mauricio was a, is a social worker, uh, quite a liberal guy himself. But he started a, so, a private social work outfit. to step in when requested to help the poor. He literally will fire his employees if they actually help anybody. Think about that for a second. What he requires his employees to do is to help the clients, the customers, the poor people to help themselves. Oh, come on. And you one full at a time. Read his just not as before. Read his book. Don't give me a come on until you've read his book. He's a friggin' liberal telling everybody that you're doing this stuff wrong, that we should trust people, all people, black, white, green, poor, rich. We are amazingly competent. <laughs> Good. They're all indolent. <sighs> oh, Charlie, shut up. Uh, if you want to help somebody, go out and help them. Come on, hey, Charlie. One full at a time, dude. Finish, Dan. I'm not going to help you, uh, Justin. Charlie, knock it off, Justin. You mentioned Milton Friedman. Uh, that's well and good. But Milton Friedman did not discuss what, where to stop, where we draw the line, where we stop subsidizing the public in their education. I recommend you look at Brian Kaplan's book and see that publication, how much we are subsidizing people to no results. And he did the studies, did the investigation. Uh, Bob Matter. Oh my God. Bob Matter. Um, we didn't spend a lot of time talking about drug policy. 
uh, and illegal drugs. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned the fact that last year, 100,000 people died of overdose. Because there are no overdoses, virtually no overdoses from drugs we buy at Walgreens. We would be saving 100,000 lives a year. I don't know how we can look at ourselves in the mirror when we're killing that many people with prohibition. Uh, Charlie, thank you for comments. Uh, we will agree to disagree. 60% uh, of Illinois offices have no opponent. And you're telling me that it's easy to get on a ballot. 60% are unopposed. That's crazy. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to say something, if I'm not, please. Sure. Okay. Um, you took, you very much do regulate. One of the previous- Let's end the evening, Jimmy. One of the previous speakers talked Jimmy. about um, deregulation of drugs. I know, I know like that. So what the problem you have in America is- it's, 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 Tell them we're over deficit. with. All right, okay, all right, okay. Uh, all right, let's wrap up. All right, look at Portugal. We're gonna, we're gonna, look we're gonna, gonna wrap up, Kelvin. No, 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 excuse me, no, I, I wasn't, I, I did kind of get a thing, if you don't mind, right? So- Kelvin, you already it, spoke at the rebuttal and we're gonna end the meeting now. We'll okay. keep the call open for, okay. for anything afterwards. So I'd like yeah, to say okay. thank you very much tonight for coming to the College of Complexes. And I'm gonna turn off the recording now and I wish all of you a good night. Feel free to stick around for our after party.